for a lot of people, it's not even a problem about time, right? It's about it's about connections. Sometimes you just don't have the right connection, you don't know the right people, or you can't afford it, or you don't have the time, or your idea just slips away by the time you find one. And they need, you know, right here in your bedroom, a software you can just type in words and the notes and sing whatever for you. Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is Kanru Hua, the founder of the music software company Dream Tonics, creator of the Synthesizer V and Synthesizer V Studio Voice Synthesis applications. Culmination of years of AI research, signal processing, and musical passion led to Synthesizer V, which faithfully replicates the nuances of the human singing voice. Its voices are available natively in English, Japanese, and Chinese, and even allows any voice to sing in any of those three languages. During our interview, Conroe and I spoke about the many legitimate uses for vocal cloning, using a clone vocal as a guide for a human singer, creating a voice library, how the field of AI is based on assumptions, and much more. I spoke with Conru via Zoom from his office in Tokyo. Let's start with um, Synthesizer. Is it? Do you pronounce it Synthesizer 5 or Synthesizer V? I would pronounce it a V, v although it actually means 5. <laughs> it does? Their story. <laughs> okay, so what happened to 1, 2, 3, and 4? Basically, I started you know, doing this as, a, as my hobby project many years ago. At first, it didn't win very well, but I, I tend to, you know, uh, keep the major version number, just keep incrementing it. So there's one, two, three, four, this get under different names, but they were abandoned in the end. And five is like the first one. It got it into the work. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, let's talk about the thing that I think everybody wants to know about first, and that's uh, uh, vocal cloning. And some people are very much against it, but the fact of the matter is there are other uses for it than than the illegal ones, right? They are. They are. And uh, I have now um, voice conversion. So so from the academic, it is called voice conversion. And uh, it's nothing new. Uh, I mean, people have been, at least, you know, in the institute, the colleges, they've been trying different 20 years ago. Of course, it got nowhere um, as realistic or as close um to the target as we're doing you know you know really uh, everything just picked up in the last five years but uh i have been studying that uh, i mean together with voice and it is all related the thing is i think you know most of the application you see nowadays um on the internet these are i mean some of them are awesome from a technical perspective but they're not having a really positive output and that's what i think the problem is in. so people aren't using it for creative uh, matters, but rather just ripping off existing artists. Well, one of the uses that I know is happening, because there are some songwriters, that I, professional songwriters that I know that have adopted voice cloning so they could get closer to the sound of the artist that they're going to be pitching. So, for instance, if they're pitching a song to Taylor Swift, this comes off the top of my head, they want a vocal clone of that because they feel it'll make it easier for them you know to to place the song as a result have you seen a lot of that in fact that's where um that's like the motivation uh behind the product you know uh we first released uh since as a v and then went down to vocal flex they are related the reason is four years or five years ago we started to you know receive requests from many users what if i can put my voice into it what if uh, I can get a uh, sincere V voice to sound exactly, or I mean, at least in the same genre as a certain artist, so I can use it for my demos. So we're looking to voice conversion, but uh, back then it wasn't, nothing was mature. Yet. So it was really just resting a little bit fun. There's a possibility you can just really drop in a few seconds of voice and really, uh, you know, shift the voice into that particular genre to fit your demo needs. So that's like the original motivation for us to develop vocal flex. How long does it take to train it? So I, I know you, you have to drop some in, but how much do you say? And it finishes hard? instantly, really just like 10 seconds or so. Someone had sent me a vocal clone of me, and they cloned my podcast. It wasn't nefarious at all. It was, I just wanted to show you what this technology will do. I made him promise to <laughs> for it not to go anywhere, but uh, 
That said, I went in and I played a little bit with one of them. And what I found is if I gave it 30 seconds, it was okay, but it wouldn't get my inflections so much. And we're just talking about me talking here. And if I gave it an hour's worth, it got a whole lot better. But singing is different. So I, I, that's why I'm curious how long does it take before the inflections are, you know, can, can happen. That's one really common mis- misconception. So what we're trying to do is now to replicate the inception here. Uh, we're primarily focusing on the voice timbre. Okay. Because again, you know, since the V already hand- already handles uh, that part, you know, the, the basis part, the, your pitch, the timing, the pronunciation. Um, but what a lot of users need really are just different voice textures. One of the things that I saw in, in some of your demos, I played with it a little bit, but what I found most impressive was how much you can change the voice texture. So, in other words, you, if you know you want, you can make the voice growl, even though you don't do it in real life, and yet you could put that in. It, I, that was amazing. I think we still could do better, actually, in that aspect. Really? Yeah. Well, it's pretty cool. You've been working on this for a while, right? I think I read somewhere 2015 is where this started for you. Actually, before that. You know, you know Vocaloid? Yeah. The software from Yamaha uh, from Japan. Um, it got really huge uh, back in 2011. That was, you know, when uh, 2008, that's when Hasna Miku came out. Mm. So they, they pair those, uh, it's, back then it's called like a voice libraries with, they pair them with animation characters. And that tends to have a like huge cult following, you know, first in Japan, then spread out to the uh, rest of the world. Back then, I was still, you know, 2008, I was in grade school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got really intrigued by that, thinking if I can make my own version of it, you know. Well, that explains why some of the the voices that you have on the side are there. They, they seem to be, be very anime-oriented, but you just explained why. That's where I started, because if you like time slip 10 years ago, the voice generation technology was nowhere close to the realism we get today. If you want to push a product back then, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to appeal to mainstream usage to like producers who want to do serious work with it because the quality just wasn't there. I think Yamaha probably had the same trouble. So they also did a lot of, uh, and believe me, quite a few years at least maybe a decade work into finding the perfect audience for their software. And then, you know, the animation market embraced it. Well, who do you think is the main audience for Synthesizer V? We have always thought, you know, one day technology will be mature enough and it's going to change the way everyone make music as, as long as they have vocals. So it's everybody with vocals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nowadays... Uh, at least until now, when you want to make some vocals, you have to schedule a session with a vocalist. And uh, for a lot of people, it's not even a problem about time, right? It's about it's about connections. You, you sometimes just don't have the right connection. You don't know the right people, or you can't afford it, or you don't have the time, or your idea just slips away by the time you find one. And they need, you know, right here in your bedroom, a software. You can just type in words and the notes and just sing whatever for you. Well, of course, it's easier to hire somebody online than it's ever been before. But that being said, it doesn't mean you're going to get what you want. And I think that's the, the problem, because uh, with, with this, at least you're going right towards something, that you, the sound that you want, like I say, the inflections, everything that, that you have in mind, where if you hire somebody then and you're not there to guide them, then you don't really know what you're getting. Speaking of that, people actually also use it to guide real, actual like, human singers. <laughs> really? So they will produce a demo track in Caesar V and present it, take it to the booth, just play it to the singer. Hey, I want this part to sound like this. And you add a little bit of my vibrato at the end of the note. Cool. One of the things that I really liked was the fact that you could stack harmonies. You can dial in the harmonies and stack them, which you can't with other competitors shall i say and one of the things i noticed is with competitors they're really good at doing octaves 
but they're not good at doing the harmonies, and that's that's what everybody wants. But it's easy to dial that in with you with what you have. I think uh, like harmonies are just uh, doubling. It's kind of getting standard these days. But uh, really, um, a part that I think since read this better, in my opinion, is the ability to generate the verse. So different kind of singing styles. If you're just repeating the same uh, singing style, the same you know micro intonations across different tracks and just shape it up and down, they still sound like the same person. It just you know it's it's gonna get into beating if you know you know two singers play together with a little bit of facing. Yeah. So you need to sound different, but different in a natural way. Yeah. Well, we even have that with. Uh... In software, with virtual consoles, for instance, where now what they're trying to do is make every channel different. If you're going to use 10 versions of it, then each one is going to be a little different because that's the way it is in the analog world. So to make it sound more realistic, then that's being dialed in, so to speak. So you're doing the same thing. We have always been trying to replicate. I mean, the holy grail in this field is to make something that's just completely indistinguishable from human saying. And uh, one of the challenges, you know, humans are random. You ask the same singer to sing the same phrase two times, and each time it's kind of different. Yeah. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. I saw that you have uh, support for Pro Tools now as a plugin, which is very cool. If I will say anything, um, I think all of, like the major plugin standards are designed, you know, uh, for more or less the real time use cases. So at one end, you have audio or MIDI coming in the other end with, you know, not so much latency. You got uh, audio really hot, fresh out of the oven coming out. But for vocal synthesizers, it really doesn't work this way because even for humans, you know, you have to read the score. You need to know what comes next. The next, you know, a few bars of notes. What are the contents? How do you prepare your muscles for that incoming note? You know, it, it's predictive and and that latency isn't constant. You know, interestingly enough, I was just on with a vocal coach, and she was telling me that a big part of what she teaches is the mental aspects, because how you're thinking and how you're feeling influences your voice so much that she had to include that because you have to think a certain way in order to perform at your best and, and not have your body get in the way if you yeah. don't. Yeah. Humans are complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I saw that you have um, the Synthesizer V engine. So I take it that's uh, you're, you're white labeling the software, right? We're offering SDKs to fill businesses, plugging developers, or you know, web services that would embed uh, our synthesis engine. So without the user interface as part of their product to enable their product to sing. Hmm. Okay. That's pretty cool. The other thing is that there's a, a lot of voices that uh, one could use that you offer on your site. Uh, I notice most of them are, they seem like they're, they're Japanese and anime oriented, but it seemed to me like you were also doing licensing deals with other voices as well. Is that the case or did I misread that? So if you mean uh, for Dreamtonics as a business, uh, we do create our own voice that directly sells to the customers and users, uh, but we'll also provide a customizing voice database as a service to businesses. So they're like, you can think of as a like, sampler companies that come to us and uh, out of custom order of voice to be made. They have their own vocal list and come into our booth or they send us the files and we process them, trim them and send them back uh, a voice database installer that can be redistributed and resold. So big picture, where do you see this going? Like what is, you just mentioned that the ultimate was adding some randomness in that the mimics a unit, a un, human. Is that where you see this going? If you mean technically, then um, I think definitely get as close to human as possible. But, but really that, that definition is a vague. Yeah. You know, uh, when we work on this kind of, even if you're just developing like a back plugin, right, you have to know whether you're not go going the positive direction or is the sound quality degrading as you upgrade version by version. And uh, if you're really a 
like a scientific believer, you you would run listening test. So hire a bunch of people, ask them to randomly present a bunch of audio file to them, ask them, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? And do average result and do a statistical analysis. We also do that. We do that a lot, in fact. And uh, we ask them whether a new version, we don't tell them which is which, of course, whether a new version of our synthesis is more natural than before. And then one day, we found that we, we just directly compared the synthetic voice to real voice. And we found that people are giving synthetic voice a higher rating than natural voice. What does that mean? I'm not surprised. I'll tell you why. I was on one of the, the listing teams for the Line 6 matrix. And what they were asking for is, okay, here's some samples. This one was done using a real amplifier that's mic'd, you know, with the great microphone and a real signal path. And this one was created artificially with the matrix. After a while, I could pick out which one was which, but I always liked the synthetic one better. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm there as well. <laughs> so the interesting part is, you know, a synthetic is something outside of the body. It's, it's nothing, it, it's, it, it has, you know, artificial beginnings. It's something being designed by humans, but your voice, you're born with it. And yet you think the synthetic voice is more natural. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. And, and also, there was a study recently done in, in the UK, and they found that 46% of music consumers could not tell the difference between something that was AI generated and something that was real, that something that was natural. Now, it could oh. be because they weren't listening closely enough, and it, there, it was more like background music to to them, but nonetheless. We well, make sure that the test participants are actually, you know, people at least having uh, knowledge of at least one music instrument and uh, has several years of education related to music, maybe not, you know, really going to into conservatory or anything, but we also had some trick questions. So there is uh, always like a clearly quality degraded like low pass filtered version of the voice present to them and see if any of the participant cannot filter out that one and we just get rid of his result. But even doing so, uh, even after doing so, we still find, uh, you know, the same result. And then we design a second run experiment to ask them why. Why do you think one is better than the other? What are the answers that you get? We found people really have different tastes. Some of them, actually most of them, are clearly able to distinguish the two systems. I mean, one is natural, one is synthetic. But they all have their own preference. Like some some would treat, and you know, humans do a lot of random things like uh, like inserting a vocal fry at the beginning of a phrase, like, ah, oh, that kind of thing. And a lot of people hate it. A lot of people like it. The yeah. synthetic system doesn't you know, quite do the same. So it always produces a slightly more smooth, uh, slightly smoother texture or... Uh, intonations than the, the real one and some people define that as natural because it's smoother well i think we're finding that in in modern music production where everything is time aligned on the grid and auto-tuned or at least tuned and you find that that i think a lot of people think that's the norm because it sort of is in production but it's not the way humans really make music you know, I'm from the old school, you know, we, we didn't do that. Everybody played together and you got what you got. You, you tried to get it as close as you could to perfect, but, it, you know, you never got there. And now we can make everything pretty perfect if we want. I guess that's what people want. I think probably a lot of people nowadays have not even seen, you know, really unprocessed vocals. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. You went to school in in the United States, didn't you? I grew up in Shanghai and went to University of Illinois, but I never graduated. Interesting. Well, okay. Why did you choose University of Illinois? That wasn't actually uh, my first choice. I I was trying to get into uh, Carnegie Mellon, mm. but uh, you know, uh, before, well, that's a little bit of ironic uh, way of saying it, but. Uh, before the AI boom came in, uh, they had the best, I think, uh, state of art research in um, 
speech synthesis. So back then, they people are doing you know, concat native speech synthesis, uh, basically just a huge sample library, but being joined together in smarter ways in, using algorithms. That was you know the best choice back then. So I was trying to get into that place, but got dec- uh, declined, unfortunately. Huh. And you didn't stay. You say you didn't graduate. What was the reason for that? Did you get a, a job? No. So the whole reason I went to the college was because I wanted to make a better synthesizer. I wanted to learn how to make a better synthesizer, a vocal synthesizer, you know. I more or less designed my own curriculum, and it took all the graduate courses in the first two years, and at 30, I realized, oh, well, there's no way I can graduate. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, joke aside, I have uh, my own, you know, uh, synthesis project going on, and it just started as a hobby project, but gradually just taking, eating away more and more time, and until the point, you know, I have to make a choice. I went to Berkeley College of Music, and then I taught there. And what was, I didn't graduate either. But one of the interesting things was the fact that so many of the well-known people that went to Berkeley never graduated. And it's mostly because they were so good they got gigs right away. So after, a, you know, even a semester or two, they, they were out in the road. And it's like, well, I, I don't need school anymore. I'm doing it. And it was encouraged that you you do that. It wasn't good for their business, but nonetheless, it, you know, it was encouraged. So, yeah, same thing. If you work the long run, you know, there will still be, you know, reputational benefits to the college, but long run. Yeah, right. Well, it's a different story now. All right. Last question. Since you've been doing this and really you're in business for yourself and you're, you're putting all this together, I'm sure you've gotten some really good advice so what was the best piece of advice that maybe somebody imparted to you or maybe you learned along the way? I learned it from my professor, um, John Allen. I never actually, like seriously, attended or published a paper in the name of uh, the research team I was in, but they kindly invited me to join their weekly meetings. If, if I'm allowed to introduce a bit of background, yeah, uh, Professor John Allen's group was doing human speech recognition. So it's now it's now like uh, speech recognition to see in the voice assistants nowadays, but rather they're trying to analyze why the human human ear hears a pa and your brain thinks it's a pa, not a ka. Mm. Their group was like the closest um, to our field in, unfortunately, in that university. <laughs> but still, uh, I was quite interested. I uh, tried to attend their groups and see the. They actually do a lot of, uh, lot of listening tests, a lot of really, really serious and carefully designed uh, experiments. Because you're you're unpacking such a complicated topic, you're you're really just breaking down the hearing component. You're going to the middle ear, you know, and all the neural spikes and all the things going on inside your brain. So they have to design a really careful test to see under what conditions people find. A constant, a constant. One of my favorite words from my professor, he said something like, you have to be really careful of making assumptions. So if I may add to his quote, I will say that you are making most of assumptions when you're not really realizing you're making assumptions. I'm saying that for not just scientific research, but also when doing businesses. You make a decision at some point, you think hey, it's got to be it. But always be aware of how much you know, how much certainty you have there. How much a chance maybe your assumption isn't true and after all the years of hard work and, oh, made a wrong assumption doesn't work this way. Yeah, it, it, I have a, a little story about that as well. Uh, at a certain point in my life, I created a startup as well quite a while ago and we were searching for money. We're going to VCs. And I remember going to one and we laid out our pitch and made some assumptions. And he said, Well, how do you know? How do you know about this? And that kept on coming up. Well, you say that, but how do you know? And a lot of it is, well, we assumed it, we didn't know for sure. And that really guided me later on when I was put into a similar position of analyzing people, uh, people's 
ideas and pitches. A lot of it was, well, how do you know? And the number of times that I just get a blank stare back was amazing because, as you say, we operate on assumptions way more than we probably should. And I think it's quite unfortunate that the whole you know field of AI is based on assumptions, and many of them unprovable assumptions. Yeah, yeah. What is one? Out of curiosity, why does deep neural network, after all? Because yeah. this theory only says you know there's a chance uh, it'll you know accurately predict what you want to predict, but it doesn't say it must. Yeah. We don't see the boundary. You know? Yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? And I think we're all learning that it, there are certain limitations and maybe we, should, we shouldn't we should assume what it's going to give us is going to be correct. What I found AI best for, to be honest with you, is not looking for facts, but looking for ideas. And just say, give me an idea for the, give me three ideas on this. And, and it would be really good at that. But if I asked it for certain facts, as a matter of fact, I had a friend who, again, he was... He was advising somebody that was going for money, looking for money. And he went to ChatGPT and asked for the number of subscribers on something or or another. ChatGPT gave it a fictitious number and he just put it in. And my friend went to pitch it and the VC looked at it and said, this number is impossible. Where did you get this? So, you know, it just goes to show you that there are certain things that you can rely on and certain other things that you can't. And that goes back to my point. You know, humans really like randomness. <laughs> we like entropy, you know. Yeah, Yeah. right, right. Very cool. Well, Conrad, thank you so much. I'm so glad we got a chance to talk. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyosinski.com. You can also learn all about the latest in music, audio, and production news, and find out about openings for my latest online classes at bobbyosinski.com. This is Bobby Osinski. I'll see you next time.